Greetings, everyone, from the National Concrete Bridge Council. We're ready to start our, uh, our webinar. I'm Greg Freeby with the American Segmental Bridge Institute and the chair of the National Concrete Bridge Council. Wanted to welcome you to our webinar today on extending bridge life using targeted cathodic protection. If you're not aware, uh, the National Concrete Bridge Council that's sponsoring this series of webinars is a, a consortium of uh, 10 industry members. You see them listed here uh, on screen. Uh, our, we're all working together to uh, promote concrete bridge construction, concrete bridges, and recognizing that uh, caring for our existing structures is also a, an important component. We've partnered with the folks at Vector Corrosion Services for this series of webinars. This one is the fifth in the series. The next slide. Um, our sixth and final session uh, this, of this series will be on March 20th. Uh, Mr. David Whittemore also with Vector will be joining us to talk about surface applied cathodic protection. So the registration is open for that, uh, that event all, as well if you haven't already signed up. At the end of the session today, we'll have a moderated Q&A. Whoever asks the best question in the judgment of our presenter will uh, will receive a $100 gift card. So uh, your name does need to be provided when you uh, submit a question. So um, the Q&A is available all throughout the, the session. So if you have a question, we encourage you to go ahead and pop them into the Q&A panel uh, as we're going so that you don't forget about them. And then we'll, uh, we'll address your questions at the end of the session if we run out of time. Uh, we'll have our presenter follow up with you to, to give you an answer to your question. So, so I'm, I'll introduce our speaker. I won't read all of his, uh, all of his experience. You can read it uh, here on screen as I, as I talk. Um, but our presenter today is Mr. Shayan Yazdani with Vector Corrosion Services. He's been there a number of years and has a lot of experience uh, with corroding reinforced concrete structures, which is our focus today. He holds a BS and an MS from uh, the University of South Florida. He's a member of the AMPP Standards Committee and is also uh, a member of the, the International Concrete Repair Institute's Corrosion Committee. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Cheyenne. Thank you very much, Greg, for the introductions. And uh, first off, I would like to thank the National Concrete uh, Bridge Council for putting together these uh, webinars and everybody that's in attendance today. And as Greg mentioned, today I'm going to talk about how we can extend uh, the service life of our bridge infrastructure through targeted cathodic protection. And so with that, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a corrosion background with the basics, um, going back a little bit into our high school chemistry. Um, we know that corrosion is an electrochemical reaction, so it has an electric and also a chemical component to it. And uh, we need four main components in order for corrosion to take place. Uh, you need to have an anode and a cathode and an electronic path and an electrolyte. And in our case, um, in the realm of reinforced concrete structures, our anode, cathode and metallic path is the rebar itself and the electrolyte is the concrete. <clears throat> and so what tends to happen is at the anode site, uh, the anode loses an electron, which is transferred to the cathode site via the elect uh, electronic path. And as the anode loses, the, the anode site loses electrons, that's where we tend to see uh, cross-sectional loss and um, rust formation. And, uh, you know, the cathode, you don't really see that. And so that's really the main key takeaway here is that at the anode site, you have the cross-sectional loss and the creation of rust formations. And so going into concrete structures uh, or reinforced concrete structures, um, you know, when rebar is casted into concrete, uh, fresh concrete, that fresh concrete has a very high uh, uh, alkalinity. Typically, the pH level is around 12 to 13. And in that state, uh, due to the high pH level of the concrete, there is a, a passive layer that forms around the steel reinforcement. Uh, which essentially protects it uh, from any um, corrosion activity. However, over time, uh, there are two main factors that can um, break down that passive layer over the reinforcement and cause corrosion activity to initiate. Um, and those two factors are chlorides and carbonation. Um, I'm from Florida, so we deal a lot with uh, chloride-induced corrosion, and that's typically 
where we see uh, chloride ions penetrating into the cover depth. And once they reach a certain threshold level, uh, that passive layer film is broken down and that's when corrosion starts to initiate. And so in Florida, we typically, you know, we have a very aggressive marine environment. So we typically see that in our bridge structures. But up in the Northeast Corridor, we typically see it with uh, de-icing salts where bridges and roads are, are uh, de-iced. And um, after the snow melts, there's water runoff and that water runoff kind of goes over all of our structure elements and starts to penetrate into the concrete cover depth causing corrosion to initiate. Um, with carbonation induced corrosion, um, it's it's a little different. Um, it tends to be caused by the creation of CO2. So as CO2 is produced, it penetrates into the concrete cover and reacts with the free lime that's available in the concrete mixture. And as that reaction takes place, the pH level of the concrete has dropped down. And as that pH level drops down, you start to lose your uh, passive uh, film over your reinforcement. And that's when corrosion can start to initiate. And so typically we tend to see this with concrete that's very permeable um, and also in, you know, in industrial sites, obviously where CO2 pollutions are high um, and also with very old structures, uh, structures that have been sitting there for a very long time. Um, due to the time and exposure conditions of them, we can tend to see uh, carbonation induced corrosion. And so topic of our presentation today, what is targeted cathodic protection or targeted protection. Um, you know, one big note is that corrosion is not always uniform over our structures. Uh, depending on a number of different factors, you can have different uh, corrosion rates or corrosion activity. And so it's important to really understand your structure uh, well enough to be able to target specific structural elements with appropriate CP systems. And as part of that, uh, it's important to conduct um, proper um, um, uh, evaluation techniques or, or methods uh, to really understand what is going on on a, on a micro level in your structure. And once that is done, once you've studied that, uh, then you're able to you know, select the appropriate CP system for those specific locations to target uh, the corrosion activity. And in a lot of time, you know, in a, in a lot of our structures, uh, we see physically damaged concrete uh, in the forms of delaminations or spalls. However, the corrosion activity is significantly outside of those areas. They may not have physically deteriorated yet or shown any signs of physical concrete damage just yet, but we do know that it's taking place in those areas. And so targeted protection um, captures that and gives us a more holistic view of how we need to address the, the, the issue at hand. And so, you know, in the image on the bottom left, we can see, you know, with depending on where the specific structural element is located, you can have a corrosion activity that's taking place. Uh, this is a beam under an expansion joint, which has failed. And uh, there is water runoff, uh, which is essentially causing uh, concrete to, to delaminate and spall. And then in the middle picture, you know, concrete cover is a very important factor in service life. Um, structural engineers are always having to navigate between having too much concrete cover, uh, which could cause potential cracking or too little cover that can cause erosion initiation early in the life, the life cycle of, of our structures. And then exposure conditions obviously uh, is, is one of the major factors depending on what kind of exposure environments you're dealing with, whether you're in a marine environment, whether you're in a very hot or tropical environment. Uh, those factors can significantly affect the, the corrosion rate as well. And so here we have a graph um, illustrative that can show the reinforced concrete condition on the on the Y axis and time on the X axis. And it's very common to use uh, hammer sounding or chain drag and in combination with, the, with visual inspection to identify areas where corrosion has progressed uh, to a point where you're visually able to see it. And those are really great techniques. However, those really identify late stage deteriorations for us. Um, and we have a wide array of tools that we could use to, to assess this, this structure and be able to identify early stage uh, corrosion deterioration mechanisms to really give us an understanding of 
what we need to do as a whole to be able to address the issue at hand once and not have to come back to it uh, in a few years time. And so corrosion potential measurements is a very um, useful tool that I commonly use and, and practice. Uh, it's based on ASTM C876. Uh, it's also known as the half cell potential survey. And what this test helps us identify is the probability of active corrosion in your structure. Um, and it's very useful in areas where you do not see physical damage of your structure just yet. Um, and so the way the test is conducted is you make a uh, structure connection to your reinforcement. You connect that to your positive terminal of your uh, multimeter and you use a portable reference electrode such as a copper copper sulfate, which has a known potential and you connect that to the negative terminal. And then you grid out your structure element, whether that's a beam, a deck, or um, a wall, a bottom wall, whatever it may be. Uh, typically, we use a two foot or three foot grid pattern. And at every location, we're measuring the potential difference between the potential of the reference electrode and the embedded steel. And what that does is it creates a contour, such as the one that you see on the below image, um, of the probability of active corrosion that's present in our structure. And so this was a bridge deck where we conducted a full survey, uh, corrosion survey of the bridge deck. And you can clearly see uh, there are areas that are a lot more electronegative uh, than some other locations on the bridge. And the scale that you're, you're seeing over uh, here, that's in the appendix of the ASTM C876. And what it tells us is, if we have, if we're reading, if we're conducting the half cell potential survey and we're getting a reading on our multimeter that is more electronegative than negative 350, we have a 90% probability of active corrosion that's taking place in, the, in those areas. And if, you know, if we're between negative 350 to negative 200, that's uncertain, but corrosion might be present and anything less than that, it's not a concern at this, at this stage. And so for this specific bridge, uh, bridge deck, um, we conducted the full entire half cell potential survey, but we also conducted a chain drag survey. And you can see all the hatched out areas, those are areas where concrete was physically deteriorating, uh, whether it was a delamination or a spall. And um, based on the half cell, we can see there's still a whole lot of other areas that are exhibiting signs of high corrosion likelihood, but have not shown any signs of physical concrete damage. And so this test is very helpful because not only can we address the delaminations and the spalls, but we, we can address the areas that are actively corroding today, but have not shown any signs of physical damage. And so we don't have to come back in a few years time and you know have to repair all these areas that, that were left untreated. And so here's an example of exactly what that contour does for another bridge deck. Um, we were able to conduct the half cell potential survey. We had some spalled locations, we had some delaminations, and uh, we were able to um, target the areas where they were actively, the, the, the reinforcement was actively corroding, but have not shown any signs of uh, physical concrete damage with, with galvanic anodes or, or some sort of cathodic protection system. And so this is very useful because from an owner's perspective, they are able to address their their ongoing corrosion activity issues um, and they're looking at it more at a holistic approach. And so depending on um, their budget and their um, schedule, they're, they're able to mitigate that corrosion and pick out specific locations to address so that they don't have to come back in, in time. And so going a little bit into the different types of cathodic protection systems that are available today uh, to us as, as engineers, um, you know, cathodic protection, the objective of cathodic protection is essentially to push the potential of your structure in a more electronegative direction. Um, and so there are really two ways that, that that can be done. It's either through a galvanic cathodic protection system, which is uh, this image on the top. So you have a, a very, uh, a, an electronegative anode. Uh, this can be a zinc uh, metal or aluminum or magnesium, depending on the application that you're trying to use um, and the structure type. 
And effectively what you do is you connect this anode directly to your structure that you're trying to protect it. And this galvanic anode sacrificially corrodes itself uh, to protect uh, your structure. And there are obviously benefits and limitations to this system. Um, it's very simple to install. Uh, there is not, obviously there is QAQC involved during the installation process of it, but it's not as rigorous as some other types of cathodic protection systems. Um, and the limitations to it is that it's a fixed driving voltage between your galvanic anode and your steel. So you're not able to adjust the output or the activity of the galvanic anode based on cyclical changes, uh, temperature changes, um, or just exposure conditions. And typically we, we tend to get with galvanic anodes anywhere between you know, 20 to 25 years. That's the maximum service life that we can achieve from them. The alternative is an impressed current cathodic protection system where we are using a more noble anode such as platinum or titanium and we use an external power source uh, to connect our ICCP anodes and our structure elements together and the external you know power source or rectifier uh, provides the electrons that's required um, to our structure. And with these systems, uh, again, just like the galvanic anode, we have benefits and limitations with ICCP systems. They tend to have a more rigorous design um, um, and the installation procedure is, is a lot more involved. The QAQC portion of it that's um, that takes place on site is a little bit more involved. However, the, the benefits of it is that the ICCP systems tend to last a lot longer if maintained properly, just because there are electronic uh, components, external components to it, so they have to be maintained and um, and checked every every year. And um, and so yeah, and so going into a little bit of a case study, uh, we have Arlington Memorial Bridge. Uh, this is a bridge where targeted cathodic protection was utilized. Um, the bridge was originally constructed um, in 1931. Uh, and it was open to traffic. It connects uh, DC to Virginia over the Potomac River, very beautiful bridge. Um, and in the 1980s, it was uh, added to the National Registry of Historic Places. It's, it's a really beautiful bridge. And it's about half a mile long. It consists of 10 um, reinforced um, arch bridges. And so this is a picture. I'm standing at the top of one of the arches looking down so you can imagine how large it is. And in uh, 2018, uh, it was decided to rehab the bridge and extend its service life by 75 years overall. So as part of that work, um, a, a Keywood and Acom were selected as a design build team to, to carry out the work. And uh, to do so, the entire superstructure, the deck was completely replaced. It was just in very, very poor conditions. And the substructure, however, though, was was in deteriorating condition, but it was manageable. It, it could still be repaired and it wasn't necessary to to replace it. And, and you, they, you know, because it was in the National Registry, they, you know, the owners didn't really want to replace the bridge or uh, demo it. And so for the substructure, like I said, uh, there was a targeted cathodic protection system uh, designed to be able to extend the service life of the uh, substructure by, by 30 years. And so, as I mentioned before, conducting condition assessment in the early study agent, the study phases of the project is very critical. Um, and so Kiwit conducted um, the sounding of all the, the arch cross walls and the arch floors and the underside. And they also collected chloride uh, sampling to identify the chloride threshold because that will come into play when you're designing any sort of cathodic protection system. And also, you know, obviously the, the corrosion potential survey, which again identifies the risk of corrosion uh, that we're dealing with in, in specific elements. And so this is a contour plot of one of the cross walls inside the bridge. And, you know, we can clearly see we have some areas that are corroding a lot faster than than others and so this really helps us narrow down which locations uh, need to be protected with with the cathodic protection system and so um, for 
the Arlington Memorial Bridge, there were two uh, CP approaches there. You know, once the study phase was done, um, it was decided to install type one a uh, galvanic anodes in the repair areas where concrete was showing signs of physical concrete damage, whether that was in the form of delaminations or spalls. And um, in areas where they had very elevated hassle potentials and high chloride content level, they decided to uh, install type two anodes, and that's because they knew there there was no signs of physical damage, but they knew there was corrosion activity taking place. And so in order to achieve that 75 year overall service life, uh, they needed to address those areas as well. And so this provided a very uh, significant you know, cost saving for the owner um, compared to a more global approach, which the owner was considering initially, but um, they they rather opted out to conduct some more testing to narrow down the locations and be able to utilize the targeted approach. <clears throat> and so here is an image of um, one of the arches. These are the cross walls that are going across and then you had this walkway that will connect the two arches together. And based on the testing that was conducted, um, we were able to narrow down and create a key for the, the corrosion risk categories. We had different corrosion risk categories uh, that opted out with different types of CP systems that I mentioned previously. And so, you know, the just looking visually looking at this, it's a lot more cost effective and also a lot faster to utilize the targeted approach to address the areas of concern versus having a global approach and applying cathodic protection to the entire bridge as a whole. Um, and so for the type two anodes, um, it combines the benefit of a galvanic and an ICCP system that I previously discussed. And this anode has an integrated battery component and also a galvanic um, component in the form of zinc. And so it has two different stages. Once the anode is installed and connected to the reinforcement, stage one kicks in, which is the battery, and it outputs a very high amount of current density onto the reinforcement, which essentially passivates it. Um, and then the, after that phase one is completed, um, phase two kicks in or stage two kicks in, and the galvanic anodes just provides a minimal amount of current just to maintain that passivity over the years. Now, the important thing is, and I'll, I'll, I'll be discussing that later in, in a few slides, but the switch over from stage one to stage two is very dependent on the micro corrosion activity that's taking place in the areas that the anodes have been installed in. Some areas might take a few months, whereas other areas might take a few days uh, to, to complete stage one. And so that's important uh, to note here. And so the type two anodes were installed in the arch floors, the cross walls and the arch undersides. And all of the anodes, like I mentioned, they were installed in, in grid patterns, I believe in at 22 inches on center in the areas that were selected based on the, the assessment and condition assessment that was done. And so a total of around 14,000 uh, of these anodes were installed. And out of those 14,000 anodes, 10,000 of the anodes were, were able to be monitored. And so again, that's another benefit that is missed quite a bit is that some people tend to think that just because you're utilizing a targeted approach, you're not able to monitor uh, the performance of the system because it's, you know, typically you, you're able to do that with global systems. But here is an example where we were, even though that it was a targeted approach, we were able to monitor 62 of the zones that these anodes were installed in. And so here's an example of uh, some cross walls where the anodes were being installed in uh, to, to protect the wall where they had elevated half cell potential readings. And you can see there's no signs of physical concrete damage um, that could be visually identified. But when the half cell potential surveys were done, uh, they had very elevated potentials. And on this image, you can see we have a large area where concrete was deteriorated, um, and that's where the type 1A anodes were installed around the perimeter of the patch to avoid the ring halo effect. Um, and in the surrounding areas, we had the, the type 2 anode being installed. Again, it didn't show any signs of physical concrete damage, but based on the testing data that, that was collected, we could tell that there was corrosion activity present in these areas. 
And so some examples of the arch floors, and again, all of these arch floors were tested and you can see only this specific area was showing elevated signs of corrosion potential measurements. Um, <clears throat> and so we were able to target those specific locations and, and provide cost savings for the owner. And this is a, an example of the type 1A anode. So we had deteriorated concrete, whether it was delaminated or spalled, you know, the contractor removed the, the bad concrete, installed anodes around the perimeter, and ultimately they, they patched it back. And so for the areas that um, were monitored, uh, we designed two types of monitoring stations. Um, both types had a anode connection, a shunt, an off switch and a structure connection. And what this allows us to do is measure the current output of the anodes in that specific zone, where typically you're, you're able to do this with, with global uh, CP systems. We were able to replicate that for a more targeted approach. And type one uh, had uh, permanent reference electrodes installed. And what this enables us to do is similar to the half cell potential survey, we're able to install permanent reference electrodes inside the zone uh, that these anodes were installed. And over time, we're able to see the potential shift of that specific zone. Um, and I have some graphs later in, in, in this presentation that we can, uh, I'll go over that. And so here's an example of one of the monitoring boxes being installed. This one looks like it had the permanent reference electrodes. And so during the project's uh, cycle, uh, we were in charge of collecting data pretty much every day from all of the monitoring boxes, all of the 62 monitoring boxes that were installed for a minimum of 50 days. So for each monitoring box, we were recording the current output of the anodes, the potential measurements, the, the interior ambient temperatures, and that provided us a lot of insight as to how the CP system was, was performing and whether or not it was meeting the um, cathartic protection criteria requirements that were laid out in the specifications for the project. And in addition, we had to run a 24 hour depolarization every, every two weeks. So you can, it was a lot of crawling through the arches, but it provided a lot of valuable insight into the performance of the system of the of the system. And so here um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but essentially we had specific criteria that needed to be met in order to ensure that the CP system was performing. Um, you know, two of the criteria are, you know, NACE or now AMP SP0216 and 0290. Um, which essentially gave us the criteria for cathartic protection. And in addition, um, this project uh, required uh, charge densities or charge requirements to be calculated to ensure that the type two anodes, which had the battery component, are providing enough charge to the steel to be able to passivate that steel. And so by measuring the current across the shunt in our monitoring boxes, we were able to identify how much charge is being uh, produced uh, by those anodes to ensure that we can satisfy this requirement. And so I'm going to cover uh, two different uh, monitored zones. Uh, one of them was for an arch floor. Uh, which consisted of, of 121 anodes, about 407 uh, square feet of concrete. And this zone was activated in November of 2019. And zone B was an arch wall, uh, which had 193 anodes, and it was just a much larger area. And this one was activated in June of 2020. And we obtained continuous daily measurements up until November of 2020. Uh, when the project was officially completed. And our last measurement was from March 2022, um, and we're in plans right now to go back to the bridge and connect, uh, collect a new set of measurements as well to just see the progress of uh, the performance. And so over here, um, we're looking at the ins and off potentials. So the, the natural potential of the CP system. So when the CP system is turned off, we'll, uh, by the switches that are in the monitored zones, we're able to turn the CP system off very quickly and measure the potential. And the blue dotted line um, is essentially the, the passivation criteria based on the NACE slash AMP requirements, uh, CP criteria. 
And so the y-axis is our potential measurements, the ins and off potential measurements that we're measuring. X-axis is the timeline, and the second y-axis is the temperature. And anybody in the cathodic protection world knows that you know potentials are significantly affected by temperatures, not only potentials, but also uh, current output of, of anodes. And so here we can see that we have, when we activated the, uh, the system, we have two big jumps in potential shifts. And that's an indication that phase one of the anode has been completed and now it's uh, it's moving in the more electropositive direction. And we'll see a same similar trend in our current measurements. And you can see the same uh, similar trend in, in zone B, which was a which was a cross wall. Um, and so in these two, this point and this point is the measurements that were calculated in November of 2020. Um, and we can see we're well above that criteria. And as, as I mentioned before, it does take uh, the timeline for phase one to phase two is very different. It just depends on the electrochemical reactions that's going on on a macro level in, in the specific targeted area that, that you're looking at. And these are the graphs for the for the current measurements. Um, we can see that uh, we have an initial current drop. And again, uh, you can clearly see that the current output of the anodes, again, is heavily based on the temperature trends. We can see it, it, it mimics the temperature trends. And um, over here in 2020, we can 22, we can see that the current has dropped below 0.5 milliamps. That's an indication to us that the anodes have switched from phase one to phase two now, uh, where the galvanic anode current output is, is taking place. And so, you know, similar to a global approach, with a targeted approach, we're still able to, to obtain these very valuable informations and really understand how the system is performing, but also provide cost saving and, and project uh, saving um, schedule for, for the owner. And so the big takeaways on this project were, you know, the targeted approach really pro proved to be efficient and cost effective in terms of uh, project schedule and, and cost savings for the owner. Um, based on the results that were conducted, that were obtained during the study phase, we were they were able to identify which CP system is the most appropriate for which locations and uh, create that key which provided the corrosion risks um, so we could address specific locations and targeted locations. And one of the biggest benefits for the owner was that they really liked the idea of an ICCP system and they were able to obtain that with, with the two, two stage system or the type two anode because it, it provided the benefits of an ICCP system to, to some extent. Uh, but they did not. They do not have to deal with the electronic components of, and having to go back out there and adjusting rectifiers every every six months or every year. Um, the next case study. This this was a a, a bridge deck where a half cell uh, corrosion potential survey was conducted on it, and um, here we're able to see um, very elevated potentials on the deck. And so the owner of this uh, bridge had an overlay. Um, asphalt overlay on the bridge. They had removed the asphalt um, prior to us arriving on site and conducting the survey. And uh, so we were able to carry out the half cell potential survey, identify areas of hot spots. And this is the, the contour plot that was created. And so we were able to design a targeted cathodic protection system for them to combat the corrosion in areas where, where we were seeing elevated potentials and extend the service life of the bridge of this specific deck uh, by 20 years. And so you can kind of see the anodes being laid down here on the bridge deck and you can see all these spots that are empty. Those are those correlate to these areas where the potentials were not as high and so the corrosion risk was not as high rather than having a global approach where you would install these anodes throughout the entire deck. Uh, the Sidbok Wold Bridge is uh, another example. Uh, it's a bridge located in um, Saskatchewan, uh, Canada. It was originally constructed in 1965, and the owner was seeing some deterioration in the bridge deck and as well as the abutments. And so 
we went out there and conducted a, a GPR survey, corrosion potential survey, electrical continuity survey uh, to really have a good understanding of exactly what the root cause of the problem is, uh, but also be able to target specific locations uh, based on the data that we're seeing. And so ultimately, uh, once the survey was done, we were able to identify delaminated and deteriorated concrete. Um, and so in those areas, type 1A galvanic anodes were installed around the patches, as you can see here, uh, we're essentially eliminating the ring halo effect. Um, and for those of you who may not be familiar with that effect, is essentially when new concrete is placed into patches, um, again, that reinforcement inside the area where there's new concrete will have a very high pH level and that passive film will, will be recreated over the steel. And if you don't install galvanic anodes, uh, what's going to happen is that the surrounding area, which still has the old concrete, you know, lower pH, possibly chloride contaminated, will tend to corrode and become the anode to protect the high pH level concrete. And so in these areas, you typically want to install some sort of a galvanic um, system or galvanic anodes to avoid that ring halo effect. And so we were able to mark out these targeted locations for the owner uh, to, to provide the service life uh, extension that they were looking for. And then in the abutments, um, we were able to see, uh, you know, visually we, we could see that there was a lot of deterioration going on in this bearing seat right here, which is right over across here. And that's because water would accumulate there and, and cause extensive corrosion. And so that was the visual inspection that we did, but we also conducted corrosion potential survey to see whether or not outside of that area, if there was active corrosion present or not. And so this entire abutment wall um, was, uh, hassle potential survey was conducted on all, all three faces. And the results yielded that, you know, most of the uh, corrosion activity was present in, in, in these, portions where we have galvanic anodes being installed in specific uh, patterns and, and spacings. And so that was able to, to reduce the cost for the owner um, and provide them with the service life extension that they were really looking for, which was about 25 years. <clears throat> and so here we can see some images of the of the anodes being installed. So we can see they're they're currently drilling the anodes. And then um, they have installed the anodes. The red header wire is what would connect all of these anodes together. Um, and then we would connect one or you know two of the anodes on opposite ends to the reinforcement to provide one redundant structure connection. And this case study was uh, from the Minnesota DOT. So um, the Minnesota DOT was observing a lot of concrete deterioration on the beam ends of uh, some of their bridges uh, where they had expansion joints that had failed, um, causing water runoff and corrosion activity to take place towards the ends of the beams. And obviously, you know, as part of the repair work, they had to replace those expansion joints and, and leaky joints. Uh, but we also designed a localized targeted um, metallizing system for them on the beam ends specifically to eliminate corrosion activity to take place in the future if the joints were to fail again. And so in, you know, this is a more holistic approach. It cost them a lot less than if they had done nothing and they would have to come back again and metalize the entire um, superstructure. And so in summary, um, you know, Corrosion reinforcement, as I mentioned, is not really uniform over all of our structures. Depending on the exposure conditions you're dealing with, the location of the structure element and the cover depths that, that you have, uh, corrosion rate in those specific locations will vary and will be different. Um, and so it's important to, to utilize techniques and methods during the study phase to identify, one, what the root cause of the corrosion activity is, and two, how far outside of the areas that you're seeing physical concrete damage is the corrosion activity taking place? Because like as you could see in the project examples that I showed you, 
um, utilizing the HAFSA potential survey, you're really able to identify areas where you do have corrosion activity taking place, but it has not yet yielded to any physical concrete damage. And so it's important to identify those locations. And, and when it comes to rehabbing the structure, being able to you know, have a good picture of where exactly you need to you know, expand your efforts in. And so the targeted approach is very cost effective and robust in managing the corrosion risk. As you could see in the Arlington Memorial Bridge, we were able to target specific locations and obtain very valuable information with the monitoring uh, stations that we had installed and be able to identify the, the effectiveness of, of that uh, zone and of that CP system installed in that specific zone. And sometimes um, one solution may not fit all. As you could see in the Arlington project, we utilized two different CP systems uh, to address the corrosion activity um, in localized areas. You know, global systems um, may be effective in some areas. They may not be. It might be a better approach to utilize two different systems for two different locations based on exposure conditions or your structure element to address the root cause of the, the corrosion activity. And now I would like to open the floor to any question there may be. All right. Thank you Thank for sorry, that presentation. Ahead. Yeah, go of ahead, course. Ben. Uh, Ben's going exactly to do. What I was uh, say. Yep, going to moderate our Q and A, and I, I see we have a number of questions uh, queued up. So uh, uh, again, thank you, Cheyenne, and we'll 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 keep going with the Q and A. Yes, ex excellent uh, presentation there, Cheyenne. Uh, we are going to jump into the Q and A here. They're starting to come in. Uh, I do want to let everyone know that you can ask as many questions as you want. There's no limit there, so uh, we'll get through as many as we can here uh, in the next few minutes, and then any that we don't get to we'll get those passed on to Cheyenne and he'll be able to reach out after the show and, and uh, answer those two for you. So to start off with uh, Anonymous said do you think it's an effective use of time or resources to core small holes through asphalt uh, to complete small scale half cell potential measurements to calibrate the results of a GPR scan? That's a good question. Um, you know we have done that in the past when we did not have the ability to mill off the entire asphalt and so we were able to you know in you know drill in small holes just enough so that we could get some water in there and, and conduct half cell potential testing i think if you are able to mill off the surface it would be a lot more viable um you would get a better picture obviously it would require you know less effort um however if if you're not able to remove them then your best bet would be to install small holes and at least that way you're able to collect some data and be able to analyze it and, and figure out where you would need to, to target. So uh, it, it's better than not doing it, I would say, definitely. All right, uh, sorry, that last one was from Jason Young and he did uh, have a follow-up. Do you have any recommendations on how far out you would typically do your spacing of each of your half cell measurements? Great question, so typically, um, Typically, we do it on three foot grid spacings. Um, however, I would recommend to not go over four foot because once you go, once you increase it above four foot spacing, you're really not getting a full picture of what you're, you're missing out areas of concrete because the spacing um, of the reference electrode is so far out. So I would say we, we typically use two to three feet. Um, however, we, we don't practice going over four foot um, uh, grid patterns. Excellent. Uh, Chris asks, uh, how do chloride levels affect anode design? Great question. So um, chloride content level is a very big part of cathodic protection design and, and anode performance. Um, in order to overcome the chloride content level um, to be able to provide proper adequate cathodic protection, you need to understand how much chloride levels you're dealing with. So typically as an industry standard, and this, this is not a hard limit, but typically uh, at 
concentration levels of 350 parts per million or greater, that is when your corrosion activity starts to initiate and starts to occur. And that's when the passive layer over the steel reinforcement breaks down. And so it's vital to know the average chloride content uh, level over your structure. So let's say you're looking at a bridge deck. If you can get, you know, a, a good amount of sampling, maybe five or six samples um, at different depths um, throughout your bridge deck, you get an understanding of what the average chloride content level is because the more chlorides you have, the higher um, um, uh, driving voltage you're going to need to overcome the corrosion current. And so, especially in terms of discharging um, current density charges from the battery component of, let's say, type 2 anodes. And so, it's it's very vital to have an understanding of, of what the average chloride content level is. Um, so, for example, in um, in Florida DOT projects that, that we're involved with, you know, sampling chloride contents are, are a very big part of that work. We need to understand how much chloride content we're dealing with so that we can design and space the anodes adequately. So the more chlorides you have, the tighter, typically the tighter the spacing needs to be. And so that needs to be taken into account. Perfect. Uh, JP asks, can we get more life from a cathodic protection application if we minimize or eliminate the pathways that conduct chlorides to the concrete? Absolutely, yeah. So typically on, um, we've done this many, many times in the past where um, we have installed cathodic protection system in, in terms of galvanic anodes and um, applied a coating over it. Uh, let's say it's a bridge deck, you would apply a coating over that. And the reason for that is you would essentially deprive the concrete from oxygen. And when you tend to do that, when the oxygen levels are lower, uh, your corrosion activity starts to, to, to get reduced. And so you would be able to extend the service life of your cathodic protection. Now, there's a caveat to that. When you're designing a CP system, you, you do not want to reduce your design service life in your calculations to account for the coating. So the coating has to be a second layer of protection. So you would essentially design your CP system for let's say 25 years, figure out your anode spacing, install them, and then you would add that second layer of protection of coating over it so that in the case that the coating once fails, you still have that design service life that's required. All right, I think these are softballs. Like, we're, we're, not, we're not getting this guy. How about, uh, is from, from Michelle, she asks, is there anything that would create a false positive for the corrosion potential testing? A false positive, yes. Actually, that's a very good question. So if you have carbonated concrete and you conduct a half cell potential survey on it, your potentials are going to be more electropositive, and that's a false positive. Um, so, and that's where you would typically have to do the spray indicator where you would drill into the concrete with, if you're collecting samples for chlorides or, or just drill into the concrete, spray an indicator in it. And if you get a color change, um, which it's just a pH indicator, if you get a color change in, in the depth of your concrete and the hole, um, that is an indication that your concrete is carbonated. And in carbonated concrete, your potentials are typically more positive. Very good question. Abdullah asks, is it possible to use similar techniques on a PT strand? With, okay, with high tensile steel, um, you would have to be cautious. You can definitely use uh, galvanic anodes. Um, you definitely cannot use an impressed current cathodic protection system because that will cause hydrogen embrittlement and cause catastrophic failure. But you are still able to utilize galvanic cathodic protection system. And uh, Abdullah, let me know if you're referring to the testing techniques or applying cathodic protection, if, if that answers your question. Uh, Jason asks, uh, can you explain why it's necessary to use a low electrical resistivity grout around the type 1 anodes in an overbuild situation? Yes, um, the reason you would want to use a low resistivity grout is because with galvanic anodes, as I mentioned, they have a fixed driving voltage based on what metal 
the anode consists of, whether it's zinc or aluminum. Typically, it's zinc in reinforced concrete structures. And so because it has a fixed voltage drive, um, if you use a very high resistive uh, repair mortar, the anodes are not going to be able to overcome the resistance of that mortar to be able to output enough current to get into the reinforcement steel. And that's why in, in repair applications, it's it's very vital. There are certain, you know, different anode manufacturers have, have different limits on what kind of uh, resistivity the repair material needs to be. But it's mainly because the, the anodes have a fixed driving voltage. And if your voltage is fixed, you know, going back to Ohm's law, you have V is equal to IR. If your resistance is very high, you're not able to output enough current to be able to, to protect the areas. All right. Uh, Britain asks uh, for the type two anodes. You might have to go back a couple slides for this, but uh, you connect the wires to the rebar and it looks to be external. Are, how are those wires protected? Um, I believe you're referring to this image here. So this is a stainless steel wire um, and these wires are coded. So the, the wires, these are copper wires that connect all the anodes together. So those are obviously insulated. But this connection over here, that's stainless steel and that's embedded with grout. So once at the next stage in this picture would be to grout everything over and that's stainless steel. So it's um, it would not corrode. Um, Anonymous asks, and I think I'm going to kind of shorten the question here, but uh, have you ever uh, encountered a problem when using both a galvanic uh, next to a ICCP system uh, installed in the same structure? Um, again, very, very good question. Um, so if you are using an impressed current system uh, such as titanium or platinum anodes, you would have to be very careful with the location of the ICCP anodes relative to the galvanic anodes because there will be interference. Um, However, the type two anodes, um, they are controlled. The battery inside of them are controlled. So there is very, there, there's almost no interference between galvanics and the type two anodes. Um, however, if you're using a full ICCP system that uses noble anodes like titanium or platinum, there would be interference and you would have to account for that um, and somehow be able to, um, um, take that into account when you're looking at and analyzing data from it. Yes. All right. Uh, Doug asks, uh, in the long term, how does monitoring work? Uh, how often do, like, how often do reports get made? And, uh, sure. and how does, what does that kind of look like? Yeah, so um, for example, for the Arlington Memorial Bridge, and we have a wide range of projects that, that we monitor, um, typically, there are two types of monitoring. The ones that I showed you are manual monitoring stations where a technician physically needs to go out to site and collect all the measurements that would produce those graphs that I showed. But we also have remote monitoring systems where data loggers are installed and connected to a satellite. And we're able to monitor the, the performance of the CP system sitting in the office on a website and, uh, and just collect at whatever frequency we would like to set it at. We could connect uh, collect data every second or we collect data every one week and so those are the two different types of monitoring systems that we have and typically with monitoring systems uh, we provide an annual report so at the end of the year we go back to the, the let's say the remotely monitored we would go back to uh, to the platform download the data analyze it produce the graphs uh, Write them, uh, write a report for the for the interpretation of the data, and send that over to the client. Uh, and obviously, with remote monitoring systems, you're able to put um, signals where if something was out of place, or maybe the potentials are extremely elevated, or you lose power, it would send us an alert uh, to let us know, like, hey, uh, you need to check the software. And then at that point, we would reach out to the owner, let them know, hey, we got this alert. We need to come to site to see exactly what's going on. And that is very key with impressed current cathodic protection systems is that if you do lose power, you're effectively 
your cathartic protection system is not working. So it's very important to have some sort of monitoring for them to be able to identify if if they are, uh, if you do lose power and, and you need to go, you do need to go back to site. But as far as monitoring reports, typically it's done at an annual rate. Some clients have manual monitoring stations where we go out to site, collect the data, come back, compile the report and send it to them. And some have remote monitoring systems. All right, yeah. Uh, Chad asks, what threshold value do you use for the initiation of corrosion in marine environments? And does that change? Is that something you can, uh, I guess, adjust which potential threshold you might be working with or how you might design it? Um, so, um, I guess I need a little bit more. Are we talking about the threshold for chloride content or threshold based on half cell potentials? Um, if we're looking at half cell potentials, we have the fixed um, um, key that ASDM provides us, which if I go back, um, it starts at negative 350 millivolts. So in terms of half cell potential readings, any potential that is more electronegative than negative 350 millivolts, there's a very, very high likelihood that corrosion is active. And I can tell you from my years of experience, anywhere, <laughs> this has never led me in the wrong direction and it's always proven to be accurate. Um, however, with chloride content levels, that's a, a different discussion based on the structure type, the cover depth, uh, the year of construction, the, the concrete ma matrix uh, information, that threshold value would fluctuate and would be different. All right, I think we got time here for a couple more questions. Um, Doug asks, where is carbonation a big issue? Is it power plants or garages, inner city traffic? Yeah, so um, carbonation, we typically tend to see this at industrial sites where there's a high production of CO2. Um, um, we also tend to see this, I mean, I've seen this on very old structures, uh, very, very old structures, historic structures. And again, carbonation induced corrosion is a is a factor of time and exposure conditions. So the longer the structure is exposed, the more carbonation you tend to see in it. And it varies. I mean, we have structures that are relatively new, but they're in very aggressive CO2 producing environments and they do have carbonation that's that's present there. All right, I'm seeing uh, kind of a theme here with uh, a couple questions, so we'll kind of combine it into one. Uh, CP is a proven technology, however, it's not widely or not used everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you recommend a DOT uh, could be influenced to better use this technology? And uh, and, and I guess what uh, reasonings or could you provide to you know, help? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good them? question. Um, it's in the world of CP, I've seen a lot of clients shy away from it because of bad experiences or their system was not maintained and nobody ever informed them that they needed to be. What I personally like to do is use project examples um, and just inform them of the facts. For example, with ICCP systems, they're very good, they're very effective, but you do need to maintain those systems. And just being upfront and honest about it uh, goes a long way, in my opinion and has changed the opinions of a lot of people over the years that I've worked with. Um, I've had clients, I just inspected a parking garage where they had installed a conductive coating on the underside of several of their floors and installed the rectifier and they were seeing the coating become, you know, just disintegrating. So they called us, We, I went out there, took a look at it and when I went to open up the rectifier, none of the wires were connected to the rectifier terminals. So obviously there was a disconnect there between the, maybe the contractor that was conducting the work, maybe the engineer that was in charge of the cathodic protection, but the system was never commissioned. And obviously that's going to leave a bad taste in, in the owner's mouth and they're never going to want to go back to that. But, you know, you know, luckily in that project, we were able to conduct the appropriate testing and show the results and you know, the, the the owner was convinced and they're moving ahead with installing another form of cathodic protection system now. Um, but really, I and I feel like using past project examples that you have proven data for to show them that 
this is the data that this is what the structure looked like prior to the CP system being installed. Um, this is after it. These are the data and just kind of walking them through it um, has has really helped a lot and also showing projects where CP systems repairs were done. Rehabilitation efforts were taking place, but no CP system was installed. And what are the conditions of those structures in five to six years? We have projects of examples of that as well to show the difference with when a CP system is installed properly and maintained properly versus uh, structures that either had a CP system but weren't maintained, weren't commissioned, and structures that didn't have any CP system whatsoever. All right, excellent answer there. If you want to move on down to uh, the contact Cheyenne slide, oh, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll point out uh, how these people can find you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, on, on screen here, you can find Cheyenne's information. Uh, you'll be more than happy to answer your questions, uh, probably uh, during daylight hours. And yeah. uh, with that said, you can, you'll can also be able to find these recordings and future events on our website at wesavestructures.info. And with that, I want to thank you all for coming. And thank you, Cheyenne, for putting on this awesome presentation. Thank you, everybody, for, for attending. And thank you, Greg, uh, for providing us the platform. Absolutely. Thank you, Cheyenne. We appreciate you sharing uh, such great information. Looks like we had great participation today and attendance. So, uh, so thank you, everybody. Look forward to next month's uh, last webinar for this series. Excellent. And thank you, everyone, for coming again. And let's get out there and save some structures. Mm -hmm.